Good afternoon and welcome to Take the Lead. I am your host, Mark Seal. And we are live as we are every Thursday at 3 p.m. And first off, I just want to thank you guys. This last eight weeks of doing this show has been a blast. Obviously, we're going to continue and continue to grow the community. And what makes the show so special is that the premise is all really surrounded by you guys being the star of the show. Basically, you send in your video of something you're working on, whether a song, a riff, a solo, some technique, and we're going to all as a community watch that video together on the show, break it down. I'm going to do my best to help you out and kind of help you continue along in your musical journey. We also have a section of the show called uh, Welcome to the Stage, and that's where we feature performance videos. So if you have something cool that you can play on guitar that you think will inspire the rest of us, please send that in. We'd love to feature you on the show, and we'll obviously give out your Instagram name and all that stuff if you want to try to attract some more followers. We also have Take the Lead section. The Take the Lead section, again, it's about you. It's where you guys get to determine what we're going to do for the last segment of the show, and we'll talk about those in a few minutes via the poll. And other than that, we just really appreciate you guys being here. Please tell others about it and uh, get ready because Take the Lead starts now. We have an awesome show today. I'm excited about the video that got sent in. It's going to deal with something that a lot of people ask questions about, and we're going to be able to really break it down for you today. But before we get there, let's talk about the Take the Lead section. That is determined by a poll that will be up on your screen at some point. And the, the categories today, as I see, are feeling loopy. That's where at the end of the show I'm going to maybe talk you guys through a loop and maybe talk about maybe a couple of parts you can play together. That's always a fun segment using a loop machine. Uh, Mark's Roadshow Stories. A lot of people want to know some of the funny things that happen on the road, and uh, those, those are always fun to tell some of the more um, funny things that happen along the way or even the cooler experiences I had. And then Mark's favorite speed exercises. This is just, if you guys want some more exercises, I've got a few that I typically will work on if I'm trying to build up my technique or trying to get more accurate or more fast, obviously, hence the term speed exercises. So definitely you're going to want to act on those pulls. And then also remember at the end of the show, the very last thing we're going to be doing on a weekly basis is name that tune. And that's just where I play a riff. First one to get the artist and the band or the, I'm sorry, the artist and or the title. And you have to get them both, not one or the other. Uh, there's prizes. We have Elixir Strings has been really cool to me for many years. I love their products and uh, they've agreed to send us some strings to send out to you guys. So if you win name that tune, you'll be getting a free fresh pack of strings from Elixir Strings. So thanks to them. But with that, let's jump into our welcome to the stage portion. And the welcome to the stage portion is where I'm going to welcome to the stage. Um, I'm sorry, setting the stage. I got it backwards today. Setting the stage is where we set the stage for the lesson that we're going to teach here today. And this one comes into us from Irvine, California, from Todd K. I'm going to grab my headphones and we're going to watch this together. And we're going to see what we're working on today. So go ahead and roll the video. Hey, Mark, how are you doing? It's Todd, a self-proclaimed mediocre guitarist. And today I got a question about uh, Texas Blues Shuffle. What I'm trying to play is, here's the melody. But I want to play it in the Blues Shuffle style, which is something roughly like this. But I don't really know when I'm supposed to be muting, when I'm not supposed to be muting on the kind of the melody notes. Do I just play and pick them one at a time, or should I be playing everything and muting the strings and uh, uh, struggling with it? Anyway, if you could help, that's my question for today. Thanks, man. All right. So, Todd, thanks so much for sending that in. That's super cool. Uh, we love, I love that song. It's Pride and Joy, basically, I think is what you're working on there by Steve Ray Vaughan. Really a, a common, um, common riff. People love to play it, and it's often played wrong. In fact, I remember doing road shows a couple of years ago, and somebody said the most commonly wrong played riff in Texas and music stores is that song. So uh, Pride and Joy, Steve Ray Vaughan is what I'm basing off of what you said there. And there's, there's a couple of things that we really want to work on. So we're going to get a little bit in depth on this because again, I, I get this question a lot. Um, the first thing I want to talk about is what is a shuffle versus what's not a shuffle. So I'm going to just kind of work with a clean sound here for a few minutes. And if we start with what we call straight eighth notes, right? We talk often about rhythm. We just want one steady speed with our right hand. We want that back and forth. So I'm gonna just kind of mute the strings out here. This is all about right hand now. And straight eighths would just be one and two and three and four, and four right? If I do that tapping, one and two and three and four, and what you can see 
is all the intervals are exactly the same. So at that same tempo, if I put in a shuffle, it almost sounds more like a horse kind of cantering, or whatever that word is that they do, uh, where they kind of slowly start to, to gallop. So what you get is the straight eights would be this, one and two, and then the gallop or the shuffle, right? It's still one and two and three instead of one and two and three and four and one and two and three. If I do that with the guitar, one and two and three and four, then the shuffle. And it's the best way to learn that, I think, people try to explain it by writing it out with your dotted eighths and all that stuff. I think it really is just use your ear. If you have a straight eighth and then the gallop or the shuffle. So you kind of want to start there and learn how to get that basic rhythm. There's a great riff that I'll teach you guys later on in the show that, that a friend of mine, Chris Falson, wrote that really encompasses this well. And it might be a little bit easier than what we're trying to do um, for the Steve Ray Vaughan one, but let's dive into the Steve Ray Vaughan thing. What he's doing on this particular riff is a couple things. One, he's hitting individual notes where you're hearing individual notes while hitting all six strings. And so the way to do that is it's really a huge exercise in learning how to mute better. And it's a combination really of both hands. So what I would recommend you try just to start out of the gate is see if we can get just the uh, six string to ring by itself. And the way I do that when I'm playing a riff like this is my first finger's laying flat across strings five, four, three, two, and one, and the sixth string is open. So if I hit all six strings, you only hear that sixth string open, right? You can see here. But I'm hitting all those other strings, and that's what gives us that really kind of neat percussive sound that's, that's going on with the riff. The other thing he's doing on this particular riff is every upstroke, he's hitting the strings open really quickly and then lightly laying your finger across the string like that. And that, that right there is another exercise we want to work on is just taking this one phrase of hitting the strings up and having your finger mute it. Now the, the typical you know, pitfall that most people fall into is when they push their finger down here, this first finger, they push and you get noise in it or notes fretted. We want to avoid that. We just want it to stop the string. Right? So if you look closely from the, the wide angle, you get this upstroke and then stop the strings quietly. So that's the upstroke virtually every time on this riff. What he's doing with the left hand, back to that, we had that six string open, right? When we had it just the six while hitting all six strings. Well, the next note being that third fret on the six string. Well, now what I do is I leave my first finger still kind of flat across there, keeping those other strings quiet. So that again, if I hit all six strings, this is muting everything else out, and all you're gonna hear is the sixth string. Right? If I don't do that, if I don't mute it, you get all those notes in there. So now you have this down, the next one is also a down. Okay? The next note after that is first finger, second fret on the fifth string. And one of the tricks I do here, some people will roll their thumb around the back, that's cool. I tend to get the tip of my first finger butted up against that sixth string, as you can see there. And that way, if I hit that sixth string, it's already muted by way of that. I don't have to bring my thumb around. Now you can, but I don't, for whatever reason, I don't do it that way. Um, so when I do this, though, now I can hit all six strings again. My first finger is laying flat across everything else. The tip of my first finger is muting out the sixth string. Back of my first finger is muting out strings four, three, two, and one. And my first finger is fretting out that. So I should hear click, note, click, 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 click. Now if I hit all six strings, you only hear that note. Now I can again leave my first finger down as much as possible and add my third finger now to the fourth fret on the fifth string. And again, the tip of my third finger also will hit that sixth string. But sometimes if I'm using my third or fourth fingers, another option is to take that second finger that's just hovering and lightly, just barely touch that sixth string also to really keep it quiet. So here if I hit all six strings, again, you're only hearing that note. Next note is the second fret on the fourth string. Again, tip of the first finger is getting that uh, fifth string muted out. Now here my thumb will come around because I gotta get that note quiet, or I will also often you know, rely on my right hand just simply not to hit the sixth string. And the fifth string's muted, the back of my first finger's keeping the rest of the strings muted. Okay, so we have back to the third fret six, and then back to the second fret fifth. And then the last thing he's going to do is he's going to bar the uh, second fret on strings four, three, two, one, do a downstroke, and then lift up, and then mute. So now we're going to add those mutes that we talked about a moment ago. So we know the melody is that. And then that. Okay, so we put the two together. We have the single note, 
Then we come up, hit the strings open, and then lay your finger flat to stop it. Like that. It's hard to do slow, but you get the idea here. Okay. So if I do the whole riff, I'll try to do it slow for you. It sounds and looks like this. Relax and try to play it more natural. Okay, so that's that basic idea. So the way you might want to break down practicing it is doing each one of those things I showed you individually. Practice muting each note where you can successfully get just that sixth string to ring with nothing else after hitting all six strings. Second to that, get that third fret, and then second fret fifth, and then fourth fret, second fret fourth, and then back to the, right? And then that exact same riff, what you notice is in your typical 12 bar blue fashion, after four of those, it just jumps up and uh, moves everything down one string physically uh, and just plays the whole. I think it was twice and then one, but whatever the case is, it's a total of um, four bars up front. And then the phrase. We would call that like the turnaround. That's kind of where it goes to the five. We're going to do a deeper 12 bar lesson. But that's kind of the idea on how that shuffle thing works. So if we get those individual notes, that's good. The other thing you're going to want to do then is obviously work on the, the down, up, mute with that feel. And then add the two. And then put it all together. Okay, so that's, that's a, a more difficult version of that because you're dealing with so many open strings there, it's hard to control some of the muting that you want to control there. So a friend of mine, Chris Falson, great worship leader, great guitar player, he's got this, this cool blues thing that, that he plays where he does a similar, that, that same feel, but he does it with a little bit more manageable and controllable 12 bar blues pattern, makes it a little bit easier to keep the strings muted. So I thought I'd show you this kind of as, as a little bit of a bonus. Um, we're gonna start, we'll do it in the key of G. And we're gonna start, we're gonna play this simple pattern. I'll show you the pattern first, then we'll put the, the Texas shuffle to it. We're gonna do a third fret, sixth string, to a, and I use my pinky, fifth fret, fourth string, first finger, third fret, fourth, and then pinky, fifth fret, on the fifth. So I'm just doing fingers one, four, one, four, and it's third fret sixth, fifth fret fourth, third fret fourth, fifth fret fifth. So we're basically doing that shuffle feel. That's individual notes. Now again, we talked about straight eights versus shuffle. If I play that with straight eights, I'll play at the exact same tempo. In fact, I'm gonna try something for you really quick. Check this out. I'm gonna throw it on just a cl uh, quick click track. Oops, hold on. Uh. Okay, there's a click. So watch this. If I play it with straight eights, what you're going to hear is one and two and. Okay. Now I'm not changing the tempo. Listen to the swing feel, the shuffle. Eights. Shuffle. Okay, so that kind of gives you, you can hear that feel difference that we're talking about. There's no tempo change there. That's the thing that people often think when they're hearing these, the, when something switches to a shuffle, it sounds almost like there's a tempo change. There's not, it's a feel, F-E-E-L, it just feels differently. And that's something you want to work on. So this riff that he's playing, we have those notes and that feel, but now let's apply that same kind of Steve Ray Vaughan thing to it. What if we hit the first note with a downstroke, leaving our first finger really flat across that fingerboard to keep it quiet. And we get that. So we go. And that's giving us that practice of that first finger kind of staying put and coming up and down. Right? And then. And then put it together slowly. And then we can take an octave shape if you want. We get a little more advanced with it. First finger, third fret, uh, sixth string, pinky, fifth fret, fourth. 
lay my finger flat, and I can keep that same rhythm going up chromatically. So I'm gonna go three, four, five, six. And then go to the eighth fret. This would be our four chord, and we'll play that twice, same pattern. Back to our original third position. And then we could just hang out on a D7 chord, which is second finger, fifth fret, fourth. I'm sorry, fifth fret, fifth, first finger, fourth fret, fourth, and third finger, fifth fret, third. Walk down. Back to the one chord. And then we just do that old traditional uh, chromatic C, C sharp, D7, which is third fret, seventh, fourth fret. So if I put all that together, we're doing kind of the same pattern, just moving it around. It's a little bit more simple, I think, than the, the SRV one. So slow, actually, I'll just put it together one time for you. You can go back and watch this on the archive version of this. By the way, if I didn't mention that, you can watch these archive shows anytime you want. They're on fugu.com forward slash take the lead. All the episodes we've done so far are available there. So you can watch those after hours. And this episode will be up usually Friday afternoon. So tomorrow afternoon, you should be able to see this one as well. So you can go back and work on this over the weekend so you can crush it for the weekend. All right, sounds like this. Side shot. on your little tangent and throw that into a looper and it's pretty fun to do. So I hope that gives you guys a pretty good idea of the whole shuffle thing. And when you go to practice it, just take it slow and really dissect one section at a time. For me, whenever I do something, it's almost like cooking, right? I wanna have a few different ingredients. I'm gonna get each one prepped before I put it all together because it's really difficult to try to do all those things at once and focus on both hands, muting, hitting the notes, the right patterns, the right feel. So work on your feel, work on getting the right notes, then work on the muting. Maybe in that order might be a good way to go about it. And uh, that's pretty much it. So we are going to go into our Q&A for this section. If you have any questions regarding the 12 bar blue stuff or any of this stuff we just talked about right now, now would be the time to throw those up. And I also want to tell you, because we um, feature your videos on the show, we like to give the, the person that's uh, on the show a gift. So we already sent Todd his mug. We're going to see a picture of it. But what have we here? Check this out. One, if you win name that tune, we're gonna get some elixir strings later. That's cool, but check this out. Got one of these. This, it will be for you, right? You, if you send in a video for next week that I feature as our lesson. So I really want you guys to do this. Start sending them in. You can go to the fugu.com page. And if you, uh, if you feature on the show, we're gonna, we're gonna give you this mug, but I'm also gonna mandatorily sign it, <laughs> unless you don't want me to, in which case I'd be glad not to. But it's a, a super cool mug and really, really appreciate Elixir for sending this stuff out to us. They want you guys to be happy and I, I love their product. So it's kind of a neat, a neat uh, sponsor for us. So with that, send in your videos for next week and I hopefully will feature you on here. Let's, uh, let's jump into some of the questions here regarding the blues. Are the blues shuffles good to learn if I'm trying to improve my timing from Gary G? Absolutely, I think that's, um, it's one of those things when you can go back and forth between the feel of, um, of the, the straight eights and the shuffle, that's good. And it will, it will help your timing because in most cases, you wanna do what I did when I had my click track here, have that, my timing is gonna be impacted by me playing to that. Or, right? So it will improve your timing if you're practicing to a metronome. If you're just kind of faking your way through it on your own, Typically, your timing is going to sway a lot more. You'll still get better because you'll get the right feel, but at the end of the day, I think you really want to put time into a metronome trying to really get that feel consistent, and that will certainly um, improve your timing. Uh, from Dylan, can you get the Texas Blues Shuffle sound just playing one note at a time? Um, I'm not sure if you mean like doing... That's one note at a time there, or are you thinking more like... Like one note like that. I think that's what Todd was doing in the video, and um, you can, but it doesn't sound, that's not what Steve Ray Vaughn's doing. If you watch him play, he's always just digging in, just mashing. It's, that. it's all six strings, and that's a part of his tone and his vibe, and I think most of us consider the Texas Blue Shuffle a Stevie Ray Vaughn thing. 
at least when I did my homework on the internet. You know, it must be true. It was on the internet when I read it. <laughs> um, should I always be muting my upstrokes from Layer Cake? Um, I think, again, to me, I don't know a lot of this, this style of music. It's not it's something I listen to, I like, when I've been out in Texas and gone to clubs and bars, I've heard it, and, but I haven't spent a lot of time working on it, so I don't know if that's a standard thing or if that was something that was Stevie's thing. That's a great question. Um, I think, really, what you should be doing is do what sounds good to you, what works for you. And what you shouldn't be doing is not doing something because you can't do it. There's a lot of positives and negatives in there. Meaning, you know, I think I've said this on previous shows, and I always believe this. Don't avoid something because it's hard or because you can't do it. Work through it and be consistent and do it frequently over a period of time until you get it. Then you say, well, you know what? I hate that muting. I don't like the way it sounds. Well, don't do it. You don't have to do it, right? If you don't like it, but at least learn how to do it so that it wasn't that you were not doing it because you couldn't. That's a mouthful. Okay. Anyhow, great questions. Uh, from Cave. What's up, Cave? He's, uh, he likes my Zeppelin shirts. You want to hear some Zeppelin? Uh, all right. I'll play one Zeppelin tonight, I love. Oh, there's a bunch of them. This should be like a medley. Trying to play it as sloppy as I possibly can <laughs> to be authentic. <laughs> Great stuff, man. I'm a huge Zeppelin fan. I grew up listening to all that stuff uh, tons. I remember one of the first finger picking songs I ever learned was that Babe, I'm Gonna Leave You. And I know it's done with a pick, but I learned it finger picking. It was one of those things that really helped me along. So, so those are all great questions, you guys. I really appreciate you guys uh, participating in the show. It makes it so much more fun for me. Um, David Meltzer, Metz, Meltzer, there, sorry, I can probably get it. Sounds like Greta Van Fleet. Yeah, Greta Van Fleet sounds so much like Zeppelin and, and uh, early Rush. That second album, I noticed, had a lot of Rush influence on it, especially some of the vocal stuff. So cool band. If you haven't checked them out, so those kids, I guess they're not kids anymore. They've been around for a while, but um, really good stuff. So appreciate all the comments. I want to move on to our Welcome to the Stage segment so we can get more to the, uh, the poll stuff. And the Welcome to the Stage, I made it a point to not watch these videos. Our producer here, Time, who you saw on last week's show, uh, the crew here kind of goes over the videos and they pick which ones they're going to put on. Today, it's one from Elixir. Um, you guys did not send in one to inspire me this week, but a lot of the guys um, from Elixir, there's a lot of great artists that uh, I'm in good company with for them. Uh, this is a guy named Chris Turpin. I have not watched this yet, so I'm looking forward to seeing it. He's in a band called Ida May, uh, but his name is Chris, and we're going to roll that video now. super cool. What I love about that, Chris, is it, it kind of reminds me, I'm not sure if you're a fan of Big Wreck or not, and Ian Thornley, but some of that had that kind of that tone. Love the wall pedal on there. Um, love the feel you got on the guitar, and it was just a really fat, warm sound. Nice work on that, and thanks for sharing that with us. Um, I'm definitely going to check out more of your Instagram stuff and see what's going on there, and the rest of you should do the same. Uh, I really appreciate people that will actually make these videos, because I do watch that stuff, and as you guys do, and we typically get really inspired. It makes me want to pick up my guitar every time I watch a handful of guys playing stuff, especially stuff I don't play a lot of. It always kind of broadens our horizons and gives us more, more ideas for inspiration. So thanks a lot for that. Really appreciate you sending that in. 
and it looks like it's time for you guys to take the lead and what that really means is that we're gonna look at the poll results they are in you guys have been voting and the winner is my favorite speed exercises I'm so stoked you guys picked this one because this is something that we deal with often and I've been noticing I've been playing almost exclusively at home acoustic guitar I'm not playing a ton of electric guitar these days just seasons as I think we all go through as guitar players we go back and forth and what I noticed is I've been getting a little bit sloppy lately. I haven't put that time into all my shred stuff. When, you know, like when I was younger, I was putting a lot of time into metronome and fast playing. And so I kind of gone back to some of my favorite exercises. And I want to give you guys a little more of a lesson here, if that's all right. I want to be a little self-indulgent and talk to you about how I approach working on these types of things. And I, I break them down into different categories, right? I'll have, you know, whether I'm doing tapping stuff or if I'm alternate picking or if I'm trying to speed pick or do arpeggios or left hand exclusively. And so... Uh, there's some there's some constants though that remain and so the first thing we're going to talk about left hand today and some of the things that I, I try to remind myself of what what are the most common intervals and there's really five intervals that I can narrow it down to that you're going to see all the time in phrases that you're playing and we'll look at this I'm going to look in position I'm going to be in seventh position let's do a close-up I'm going to identify the the our intervals we're speaking of and then we'll move on from there so actually I'm going to do uh, first finger eighth fret on the sixth string so let's do a close-up on that if you can and what we're going to do is I'm going to do 8 to a whole step to 10 to a whole step to 12, okay? That's called a whole step to a whole step. That's our first common interval. Another common interval is going to be what's called a half step to a whole step. That means I'm going to do a whole step from 8 to 10, but then a half step to 11. So a whole step, half step. I think I said that backwards before. So a whole step, half step. Then obviously you guessed it. The other one would be half step, whole step. So 8 to 9 to 11. And then our two pentatonic patterns would be a minor third, which is just first finger uh, eight to 11. So it's really three fret differential. And then we have just a straight up whole step finger one to three. Okay, so to recap that, what we have is we have whole step to whole step, whole step to half step, half step to whole step, minor third, which is first finger to pinky and then whole step, which is first finger to third. Okay, so if we look at a pentatonic scale, I'll do a C minor pentatonic briefly, and what you'll see is that it's always gonna be, for that minor third interval, one fingers one, four, then one, three, one, three, one, three, one, four, one, four. So you see those two intervals are there. On our major scale, I'm gonna do a C major scale here, starting on the eighth fret, you'll see we have whole step, whole step, again, whole step, whole step, then we have nine, 10, 12, which is a half step, whole step, same thing on that string, and then we have whole step, half step. So between a C uh, minor pentatonic and a C major scale, we cover all five of those most common intervals. So if I know those are the really common intervals, then I think one of the things I really want to think about then is working on each one of those individually and getting really good at them. So if we want to talk about just getting comfortable with the patterns, hammer runs and pull offs are a good way to spend time focusing on our left hand. So I'm going to start on the eighth fret of the first string. We'll just start kind of randomly, but I'm going to start with my half step, whole steps. I'm just going to do uh, eight, nine, eleven, and back down. So let's get a close up there, and you can see eight, nine, eleven. I'm going to leave my first finger down. I'm just going to hit the first note, and then I'm going to do a hammer on to nine, and then back. I might speed up and slow down, but the reality is I'm going to start trying to warm up and get faster at doing that. Once I can do that comfortably, I'm going to do the same thing with my third finger. Now I'll swap out to the whole step, half step, which is going to be 8, 10, 11. And one thing you may notice, again, back to our earlier part of our lesson, is my first finger is on that uh, second string, slightly keeping it quiet. I'm going to remind you of that often, even in upcoming shows, because that's really a good, good tool to have in your, your tool belt there is able to keep the string above it quiet with your first finger. Okay, the next one, I want to give you my idea on something. We have whole step, whole step. And the whole step is going to be, in this case, 8, 10, 12. Right? Same thing I did before. And people always ask me, what fingering should you use for that whole step, whole step? And I've seen, I've seen a lot of people use their third finger, even on these big stretches down here. Right? You can see. But they'll, they'll use their third there, or they'll use their second. It doesn't really matter. What I want you to do is ultimately be really consistent with which one you decide to use. For me, what I found works best is on the lower notes, it's always my second finger, my middle finger for that middle note. Okay? So you'll see first finger, second finger, fourth finger. 
and then I've given myself a definitive cutoff point of that. When I get to the 12th fret, anytime I do a whole step, whole step after the 12th fret, it's always my third finger. And the reason being is if I keep my second finger there, my hand tends to turn a little more sideways. That doesn't feel as natural as that. So as I go up, if I did a whole step from 8, 10, 12, it's gonna be my second finger. But the second I get to 12, I'm gonna switch to my third finger. That's just a personal preference. Give it a try, it's worked for a handful of my students. But either way, if that doesn't work, then commit to just your second finger for all of it or just your third for all of it, or mix and match. But give yourself a definitive cutoff point so you do it exactly the same way every time. One of the ways that we get really accurate and clean in our playing is if we're consistent in our playing. If sometimes you come up and sometimes it's your third finger, sometimes it's your second, your brain's gonna have a brain fade, be like, oh, I don't know which one I'm supposed to do right there. And it's just gonna throw one down. And you'll get there, but it might be a little sloppier. So one of the ways to really manifest clean playing is to do things consistently and put some rules in place that accommodate your particular playing style, right? So, so you do those, those hammer rods and pull-offs, that's a great way. Then in other ways, you might wanna just stay on one string and work on your, your alternate picking, right? So in this case, I'll do the 13th, I'll do the 10th position second string. And I'm just gonna play like, a, I'll do 10, 12, 13, 12. So this is that alternate picking, hitting each note one time. And I'll do the same thing with my second finger. And I'll do the whole step, whole step thing. Or with my second finger. And then another way you can approach that same thing is climbing up on a string. I might start in the third position and do the, ha the whole step, half step. Then go to the fifth position, do the half step hole. Then go to the sixth position, whole step hole. Then go to the eighth position, whole step half. Just kind of start over, then 10th, half step hole. So all I'm doing is I'm taking the, the last two notes of each sequence and making those the first two notes of the next sequence. So if I do that, I can cover those patterns. So something like this. Now, you might notice I'm using my arm on that right there, right? You can see my arm's a little more tense right here when I'm doing that. You can also do your other picking where you, you do more of the wrist, right? So I, either way works. I just find if I'm doing that particular type of thing, a lot of times I want my hand a little more on the guitar to keep some of the strings more muted, keep a little more quiet. And then another one I'll do is when I'm starting to actually change strings, right? If I want to do something... Like, Something like this, I'm combining alternate picking with, um, with speed picking. Speed picking is where we rake into the next string. This is kind of a fun exercise, and I like this one because it's often that I want to try to, um, to combine techniques, as it were, you know, because you can't always do one consistent technique throughout a riff. So here, um, I'm kind of making this up on the fly, but let's see, we'll do 10, 12, 13, 12, 10 on the first string, starting with the downstroke. And then we're gonna to go to the second string. We're gonna do 13, 12, 10, 12, 13. Let's see. Yeah, so this is 13, 12, 10, 12, 13, 12, 10, back down. And if I do this correctly, I'm pretty sure I can rake the rest of it. I'll show you what I mean. So I'm doing down, up, down, up, down, then up, down, up, down, up, down, up, that upstroke. I'm gonna rake into my pinky on the 12th fret of the third string. And then I'm going to do a downstroke on 10 and up on 9, rake into the next 12 on the 4th string, down on 10, up on 9, rake into the 12 on the 5th string, and then back to that second finger. So I make it something slowly, so you can get the pick on here. You'll see there's some alternate picking and some speed picking. So what I'm doing right there is trying to combine techniques, and I seriously kind of made that one up right there. I come up with little exercises out of this C major scale all the time because it covers that whole step, whole step thing, that half step, whole step, and the um, whole step, half step. Okay, applying that same type of practicing to your pentatonic scales, you might think about doing hammer-ons, right? Just going up maybe three strings. Or even just going back and forth between two strings. And just by doing those hammer ons, you can work on your left hand getting faster. Um, you could do triplets like a one, two, three, four, five, six. Triplet, triplet, triplet. And then maybe go up. And 
Now, all those exercises, you're really not taxing your right hand very much at all. It's really about your left hand just being really fluid, moving around a bit. And again, every time I play this, I'm like, hmm, I kind of need work on that. So if I need work on it, there's a chance that maybe something uh, you might need to work on as well because it's something you have to stay on. It's kind of like working out. I know if I spend two weeks with a metronome, I get considerably better. And if I spend a month not playing to a metronome, I get noticeably worse. So let that be a little bit of a challenge to you. Get your metronome out and just pick apart any one of these exercises I gave you right now. They're all valid. You can take just, just work on one. If you just want to work on simply, you know, arm picking, tremolo picking this. That one exercise, that's a great exercise. Get fast at it. But the other thing I forgot to mention is as you're working on speed, it's really important to also be able to um, dynamically and, and kind of linear go up and down in your speed. So if you start, you know, slow. You want to be able to slowly, gradually ramp up and then ramp back down. That's really an important thing. And lastly, you can always throw dynamics into this where you play strings, um, you know, you dig in a little harder or let up a little bit. And I know that's something that um, Guthrie Govan, I watched you know, a lot of Guthrie videos. He's one of my favorites, as you guys know. And every now and again, he'll say something like, ah, yeah, I, th I do that or I think about that, but I don't teach that enough or I haven't really, um, I haven't consciously thought about it. I know it, but I don't think about it. So it, sometimes he'll bring those things to my attention. One thing he talks a lot about is dynamics, and that's really true. You know, work on your dynamics as well. So that's super cool. Uh, we're going to jump into our Q&A section. If there's any more questions for the day, we're going to jump into that. And then we're going to do our Name That Tune to finish off. Uh, finish off the show today and for name that tune again you have to get the artist and the song title if you won last week i.e aaron Broering and david daniels you are ineligible do not give it away we will not post it on the screen um, let's give somebody else a chance and uh, if you win you will get a set of elixir strings they're nine gauge optiweb and we'll we'll be super stoked for you dad all right so a few questions we got here who is your favorite 80s hair metal guitarist Wow, that is a really great question. This might be shocking, but I, I think I would have to probably say Vito Brada from White Lion because I think his he did all the cool Van Halen stuff, but it was cleaner, and he did some stuff, you know, some just some really great thick warm tones, almost Eric Johnson smooth warm tones, but with a lot of Van Halen style technique, and his solos had a lot of tapping. And when I was younger, I was super into doing a lot of the, you know, I don't know if I give you an example, but, but kind of that, you know. You know, doing the slidey and moving around and a lot of that stuff, or even Ben. All the, the tapping stuff I did, a lot of that was from obviously Van Halen inspired, but then watching and hearing some of his solos, it gave me some ideas I don't think I really knew before. Maybe some of the, the slide Ben harmonic stuff he would do with it. So White Line Vita brought if you've not checked out his stuff, or if you know your younger generation don't know who they are, they were just a super beautiful, pretty hair band, <laughs> but they, the guitar player was just ripping, really, really cool stuff. And I actually liked the guys from Skid Row. You know, they weren't like shred guys, but they just played really appropriate stuff for what they did. So I think between Skid Row and, and uh, White Lion, those two are really good, and um, you should check them out. Saw two songs, check out Little Fighter, it was a cool solo for White Lion, and um, When the Children Cry was a good one, Wait was a pretty good one. So there's a handful of really good solos by them. Just go to their greatest hits and you'll find, you'll find three of them. <laughs> All right, uh, if my child is starting guitar, should I buy a smaller size guitar or have them learn on a full size neck? That's from Bridget. Bridget, that's a great question. And I deal with this all the time. It really depends. If your kid's average size and 11 or 12 years old or older, they can probably handle a full size guitar. Uh, if, they're, if they're younger than that, noticeably smaller, definitely go with a smaller guitar. And the advice I would give you with that, because I've dealt with this for 25 years of teaching with you know, a lot of younger kids over the years, you want to, no matter what, have zero expectations on them when they're younger, because you don't want them to hate it and think it's school or homework. You want to give them every chance to succeed. So and often that means getting them an electric guitar, not an acoustic guitar. Electric guitars are significantly easier to fret the notes out because the strings are smaller and the action's closer. Plus, to a kid, an electric guitar is cooler. You can turn on the distortion, turn an amp up and play it. It's usually a little bit more hip, so I, I know that there was some time I read a statistic about you know little kids picking up electric guitars, and there was a much higher number of them that stuck with it. So just make it fun. Make sure you find a, a guitar teacher that's going to keep it fun for your kid and not have this pressure of just playing scales or Mary Had a Little Lamb, but somebody that's going to ask them what music do they like or listen to or turn them on to some really cool riffs and get them to get a cool riff under their fingers pretty quickly, but something that they can handle. It's not too hard. So 
Um, it just depends on the size of the kid. If they're if they're they're a smaller kid and younger, go with a, a smaller guitar. But if they're you know 11, 12 years old and normal size, get them a full size guitar, and ask them do they want acoustic or do they want electric, and that'll give them the best possibility of being successful with that. Uh, do I need to get good at playing rhythm guitar if I want to play lead from Mars? Um, yeah, you need to be good at rhythm in general, and rhythm guitar is a great way to get good at rhythm. You know, I know that there's some some good guitar players that play drums pretty good because they have good rhythm. I think rhythm is important because you're constantly getting that right hand to get relaxed and to understand keeping your arm moving forward and alternate picking. When you're strumming, effective. When you're strumming, you're you're basically alternate picking, right? So they, the two go hand in hand. I mean, you could certainly learn to play lead guitar without playing rhythm guitar, but you're going to have a lot of downtime because modern day music, you get, you know, every 20th song has a six second guitar solo nowadays. Back in the day, you could have been a lead guitar player and had stuff to do, but not anymore. It's kind of a, you don't really hear a lot of guitar solos anymore. So I, I would suggest getting good at rhythm guitar. Now, what's the most essential first guitar pedal someone should get? A great question. From That's from Benny C. So I think, I'm going to go in order. I'll give you the first four or five. In fact, I, it's funny you mention that because I, I was literally rebuilding a pedal board yesterday. Um, a friend of mine from Taylor Guitars is making pedal boards now. They're called, shoot, I think it's Prestigious Pedal Boards. I got to look it up. I'm going to show them on my, my show in the next couple of shows. Glenn does, just does great work. So I'm getting ready to put together a new pedal board. And I wanted something really stripped down. I was tired of having all these pedals, phasers, chorus, all this stuff. And what I found, what do I really need? And what I found that I need is I need a volume pedal is essential. You don't need that because you're not playing live at this point, probably if it's first guitar pedal. Uh, but the, the first one I would say is get a good distortion or overdrive pedal because it's really important to be able to go from a, a kind of a cleaner sound. So something clean to a, to a distortion sound. Those are the two most dramatic changes you're going to find between songs. You know, I always kind of go back to Nirvana, right? You hear that beginning of that. Then when it kicks in. Right, you hear this big difference in the sound, and that would be an overdrive or a distortion pedal. So number one, I would say have that. Second to that, most amps have reverb built in, so you wouldn't need a reverb. But if you don't have reverb, reverb you definitely want some kind of a time-based pedal. And time meaning when you, I think I talked about this in a previous show. And one of the challenges with doing this show is I still do private lessons, so I can't remember what I've done here and what I've done in my private lessons in the last few weeks. Um, but time base is when you hit an effect and you hear it after, like reverb or delay. Right? If I do this, here's a delay, like an echo, right? Those are time based. So most amps will have reverb in it, which is time based. So if you have that, then you're covered. So the next pedal I would think would probably be a delay pedal. Because when you're doing guitar solos, you want a little bit of that wetter sound where everything kind of decays a little bit more. And that's reverb and delay that's going to happen, make that happen. So if I've got a distortion pedal and a delay pedal and a little bit of reverb on my amp, I now have, you know, virtually. I have that sound. See how it's kind of all decaying and it's smooth and all. I have, you know, you could do, I'm trying to, from eruption, right, to, to Pink Floyd. If you turn the delay and the verb off, you can play, you know. You know so you have that distortion, and then if you've got your clean setting and your basic verb, like we talked about, you've got great clean setting. So I think, and that would be the order I would say, you've got your amp, go with a distortion pedal or an overdrive pedal, then get a delay pedal or a reverb if you don't have reverb, those are interchangeable. Ultimately what you really want is distortion, verb, delay, and chorus, and those will cover it unless you're into a wah pedal. That's another one that's great too. And those are usually abused for a while and then you kind of fall back on them a little more sparingly. But yeah, that's, that's a great question and I definitely think that's the order for me. When I build my new pedal board, right, I took everything off except my delay, my verb, my overdrive, and a tuner and a volume pedal, and that's pretty much it. Might throw on my baby crybaby, my baby crybaby. <laughs> I don't think that's what it's called. I think it's a mini crybaby, but I'll call it a baby crybaby because I just did. Uh, okay, uh, and what's up next? I think it's about time. Wait more. Let's, um, that's it. Yeah, I think we're good on, on questions. So what we're going to do, we're going to close out the show with Name That Tune this week, and the rules are simple. I'm going to play a song that I want to play, and you guys have to guess what it is. You have to give me the 
artist and the song title. Spelling's not super paramount, but getting the right title. Last week I kind of blew it. Somebody got close on it, David. And um, we still gave him the prize because we're good like that. But uh, let's see. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to use a loop for this one. No, actually I'm not. I'm just going to play a riff. Here we go. Uh, what sound do I want? So I'm going to throw a little bit of drive on this. I'm going to throw a little verb, a little delay. Is everyone ready? Are you ready? I think you are. All right, here we go. That's all you get. Do I need to play it one more time? Are there any coming in? Huge influence on me when I was a kid. One of the songs before I ever played guitar that made me want to play guitar. What do we got? Anybody? We got a winner? Send it out. Who do we got? All right, David Meltzer, congratulations. What is it though? I don't see a title. Do we know what that's called? I'll tell you what it is. Did he get it right? You guys know? Okay. It's uh, Peter Frampton off the Frampton Comes Alive album. Uh, it's called Do You Feel Like We Do? It's where he uses the talk box. I'm assuming all of you should know that song. You really should because it's just such an incredible guitar solo and guitar jam in that song and the, the talk box was super hip in there. If you don't know that song, again, this is one of those things when we do Name That Tune where uh, these are songs that you should revisit or learn if you've never heard them, because most of the time I'm going to play songs that are super hip to the guitar and influences of mine. So definitely check it out. Ron Worley, good job, buddy. You came in second. Problem is second place is the first loser, and we don't have anything for second place this week. But I know you'll be back. You always come back strong. you got a good uh, plethora of knowledge of songs, so I'm sure you'll win, win uh, next time. But I appreciate you guys tuning in. Uh, with that, let's talk about our social media. You guys, let's make this thing really grow. Uh, please start sharing it on whatever you've got, Facebook or Instagram, whatever you've got there. Follow us there. We're going to be posting more and more stuff. We're really starting to ramp that up now, and we're really trying to take this thing more, uh, more live. You guys have been our beta test for the last few weeks to make sure we work out the kinks on our end, but we're going to start doing uh, more posts out there to get people involved. But that starts with you guys, that grassroots thing of you guys posting on your timelines. Remind people about the archives. Go back, watch some of the previous shows. And then if you can always tune in um, on Thursdays, great. We are going to look at maybe putting a poll up next week of some alternate times. If Thursday is not a good time, you're going to have the, the, the ability to sound off on that and let us know what works for you guys. But my Instagram, take the lead official. You see it on the screen there. I'm at Guitar Seal. That's more my personal one. Feel free to text me or uh, Instagram, message me, whatever it is, all that stuff, uh, the socials. Feel free to contact me anytime. I try to get back to anybody that reaches out. Truly appreciate you guys. And until I see you next week, I hope you guys all have a great week and definitely practice your guitars, make the world a better place through music. Peace. <laughs>